So I'm going to read some of it to give you a grounding in, in what the exhibition covers about CAGE and then we will, um, I'll, I'll sort of discuss some of the slides a little, it's a little boring if I read the whole thing so I'll do a bit of both, hopefully it won't be boring. <laughs> um, Alright, so born in 1912 in Los Angeles, John Cage spent his life using his medium, that of musical composition, to place creative practice at the centre of a changing world. Cage defined a concept of experimental composition that not only altered the course of modern music and dance, but generated a new horizon of conceptual possibilities for artistic practice in the late 20th century and beyond. Didn't mean to go to the first slide. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Okay. Through a focused but ever exploratory body of work over a career spanning more than half a century, Cage's challenges to the discipline of music affected other disciplines as well. Generations of creators, not only composers, but dancers, poets and artists, have seized upon aspects of Cage's project selectively, according to their artistic needs and the zeitgeist of the particular moment. This has created a sense of not just one oeuvre to contemplate, not just a single John Cage, but many cages, and an array of exceptional artistic interlocutors. The exhibition takes a systematic chronological view of Cage's project in order to make it read with the consistency and coherence that Cage himself developed, which is only now entering contemporary consciousness. Just as systematically, but speculatively as well, the exhibition pre presents some of the landmark works that appeared in Cage's midst, which affected or were affected by his implacable quest for change. Today we have the opportunity to recognise Cage's major innovations as a series of conceptual catalysts through which the composer shifted the terms of creative practice at large. We can trace the radical development of his scores, decade by decade, from conventional formats like musical notation on five-line staff paper to transparencies, diagrams and purely verbal instructions establishing the conditions for unknown outcomes. Cage's composition models were developed alongside the advanced art of his time. To witness this process is to see many con the many conceptual openings he created, participated in and extended. Just as Cage's oeuvre is once again at the centre of current thought, this exhibition has been organised to place it in a precise historical context and to map the field of transformations which made, which John Cage placed, by which John Cage placed musical frameworks at the forefront of advanced art. So let me begin to draw that map for you. John Cage's first mature compositions were written between 1939 and 1951. This was the period in which he became involved with modern dance. Often asked to produce the musical accompaniment, he found modern dancers to be much more receptive and more interested in modern music than classically trained musicians. In his early years, Cage composed for percussion instruments, and an interest fueled by his studies between 1934 and 37 with Henry Cow, who had invented the string piano, that, that is sounding the strings directly rather than striking the keys and famously also Arnold Schoenberg, Cage's two great teachers. So I don't know if you know what the string piano is, but basically Henry Cowell, everyone thinks, I'll get on to talking about the prepared piano, but everyone thinks Cage was the first one to deal with the strings of the piano. But Henry Cowell actually went, opened the lid and played the strings directly. So that's sort of a precursor. In 1938, Cage moved to Seattle to join the faculty of the Cornish School. There he became an accompanist for a dance company of which Merce Cunningham was one member. This is a very young Merce Cunningham. It wasn't his company, but he was a, a, a sort of a member. Um, and he organised a percussion ensemble. It was at this time that Cage expressed his conceptual use of percussion <coughs> in the form of a lecture called The Future of Music Credo. 
Composing for percussion was a voyage of discovery for Cage. He sought more new sounds, as he said, in order to escape musical expectations. His first instruction in metal, whose cover of the score you see here and the full score you'll see in the exhibition, of 1939, used unorthodox instruments, quote-unquote instruments, such as a water gong, which was a gong sounded underwater, anvils, and car brake drums. Imaginary landscape, uh, the first one, 1939, uh, this was the first in a series of works with this, this title, treated new technologies. They All the imaginary landscapes treat new technologies. In this case, new technology at this uh, 1935 nine moment was um, variable speed turntable record players. Uh, this devote, uh, so then, so then just, I just wanted to show you these images. The first thing Cage performs as a big public thing when he comes to New York is um, at the Museum of Modern Art is uh, these percussion pieces. He had already gone further in his own work but he decided to not give the audience too much to be shocked about. So the percussion was enough. So there you have the program with imaginary landscape and other construction in metal on it and then the performance at MoMA, which got covered in Life magazine. So Cage's devotion to percussion music contributed to his use of duration structures, since structures based on harmony and melody were unavailable to him in percussion. He began to recognise the inherent logic of an emphasis on the structure of time, into which any sounds could be interpreted. In this lecture, The Future of Music, Credo, Cage announced, and this is a very famous and important early statement, if this word music is sacred and reserved for the 18th and 19th century, for 18th and 19th century instruments, then we can substitute a more meaningful term, the organisation of sound. So 1940 witnessed Cage's most transgressive move to date. In composing music for the choreography of Sevilla Fort, uh, this is an African-American dancer at the Cornish School in Seattle. She did a composition and Cage did the music. And this piece was called Bacchanal. Uh, with that, Cage opened the lid of the piano and inserted all manner of objects inside it um, in, into the strings, which muted them in various ways. He called this the prepared piano. Screws, bolts, rubber and felt acted as pre the preparations. On the practical side, it cleared the stage of instruments, making way for the dance. Um, but for Cage, it also meant that, as he said, quote unquote, the piano had become, in effect, a whole percussion orchestra under the control of one single player. The dance also spurred Cage to make his music completely independent of whatever it was supposed to accompany, uh, which would become a signature Cajun trait and a radical aspect of his future collaborative work with Cunningham. So Cunningham and he, he would be on the stage totally independent. Cunningham would be